Yeah. yeah. So I'm here at Anders Aslan. Uh, let's start with the obvious question, which is uh, Ukraine. I mean, things in the last uh, week or two seem to have calmed down a little bit. There's um, some uh, movements by the Kremlin, it seems, uh, to, to try and find a middle ground. I mean, they're starting to discuss the possibility of negotiated gas price. But where do you think it's at? Uh, do you think there's a, an end to this in, an, in, an, in the I foreseeable future? I don't really see that uh, Moscow is uh, compromising. It's putting certain restrictions on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now a question only of two uh, out of Ukraine's regions, mm -hmm. uh, Lugansk and um, in Danetsk. And uh, it seems that Russia is not uh, going to send in regular troops, yeah. but they have sent in a large number of regular troops, so at least 1,500, perhaps up to 4,500 troops. These are the different numbers that are being used. What we are seeing now is full-scale military attacks uh, by these uh, irregular troops, which uh, are pretty uh, peaceful on uh, the, the, the Ukrainians in Lugansk and Donetsk. And traditionally, Ukraine has no military whatsoever mm -hmm. in these two eastern regions, which is obviously why the Russians have chosen them for uh, this attack. So I think that this is quite serious. And uh, at the same time, I don't see how the Russians can succeed in this. What do you think the uh, the end game is? What do you think Russia is trying to achieve? I mean, are they trying to sort of take the east away from Ukraine? Are they trying to create a frozen conflict? So that, because I mean, one of the rules about the EU is you cannot join if you have an internal conflict. And so just by keeping some sort of instability in the region, you can effectively lock Ukraine out of uh, the EU forever. Do, do you think that's their goal? I, I don't think that, uh, that is uh, really easy. But what Russia wants, I think that Russia works with different uh, uh, possible aims, and uh, depending on how well the operation goes, I think that uh, one clear intention was to take the 10 southern and eastern uh, regions. That's when President Putin spoke about uh, Nova Russia, yeah. which is a concept that means uh, 10 of the southern regions, uh, and Crimea is already uh, taken. So I think that, that was one option, and uh, another option just to destabilize uh, uh, Ukraine, so that Ukraine fails. And I think that the critical issue here is that um, President Putin does not uh, accept the democratic reality in uh, Ukraine, and that's what he absolutely wants to stop. And how do you do it? Well, you try to promote the oligarchs, you try to destabilize the country so that it um, becomes a failure. But surely it's not in Russia's economic interest to see Ukraine as a failed state. I mean, the two economies are tied together and uh, a failing Ukraine also drags down the Russian economy as well, doesn't it? Not all too much. Uh, Ukraine's trade with Russia is relatively limited. It's 6% uh, of uh, Russia's uh, trade. And uh, Russia can uh, manage that. Uh, countries like Georgia and Moldova uh, and the Baltic countries uh, suffered from uh, bigger blows when uh, Russia embargoed them completely uh, at uh, various uh, times. So that, that, is, that is bearable for Russia. What about the uh, the prospects, you know, looking now at the sort of domestic situation, we've got a, uh, a president, a pragmatic president, you know, who served in both the Yushchenko and Yanukovych governments, uh, who's himself an oligarch in so much as uh, he understands business. Uh, yet the, the, the reform challenge to, to re resuscitate the economy is enormous. I mean, Ukraine is one of only two countries in the CIS that has yet to regain its 1991 value of GDP. Uh, so how, how is that going to go forward? Are you optimistic about about uh, them being able to put the economy back on track? Yes, I am. Because uh, Ukraine has now, in the last three months, done more reforms than it has done in the last uh, uh, 23 years. So this has been a big uh, push uh, in the, the right direction. And uh, 
bit of an example is uh, smart, uh, sensible, middle of the road, uh, uh, pragmatic man with uh, substantial executive uh, uh, acumen. So I think that uh, he can get the things done. The critical issue in, uh, in Ukraine is to break uh, corruption. And uh, Georgia and uh, Estonia have shown how that uh, can be done. And the European Union, which is now heavily involved in Ukraine, which has never been before, mm -hmm. uh, knows how to do that. Because they signed up already on the EU's um, anti-corruption uh, directive, didn't they? Yeah, I'm not sure about that, but uh, with the association agreement being signed now probably later in, uh, in June, uh, I think that everything uh, uh, will be set up for a big cleansing uh, uh, of corruption. And uh, also, uh, President Yanukovych uh, was such an awful economic manager, so he can only improve on his uh, policies. So apart from corruption, what do you think are the most important things they need to do that will turn the situation around the quickest? Well, uh, more specifically, on how you fight corruption is uh, clean up the energy sector. Do away with uh, the energy subsidies that uh, are about 7.5% of the GDP paid for by the uh, budget. So that's the big thing that needs to be cleaned down. And uh, if you do that, you both improve the budget situation sufficiently and you clean up uh, the uh, corruption uh, in Ukraine. So it's not uh, that we don't know what to do in the, in the Ukrainian economy. It's much more uh, that there needs to be a political will to do it. And now there is such a political will. Do, do you think um, that the EU's deal that is being offered is a good one? It's just that both Yasenyuk and Poroshenko have hesitated when it came to signing off on the economic part of the deal. And, you know, if you look at the people who've drilled into it, they're, they're saying that it's actually quite a harsh deal uh, in some sense. The Ukrainian exports to the EU are restricted to begin with. Uh, and it seems that the government itself is not entirely happy with the terms of the deal. That they're not going to get that much out of it, at least to begin with. Um. This is a very good deal. It means that 97% of all Ukrainian exports will be without any uh, quotas or tariffs into the uh, EU market. Some of the cultural products will be subject to, uh, to quotas. But this is a, a, a really free trade agreement. It's asymmetrical so that uh, the European market will open up uh, uh, several years before Ukraine has to open up its uh, market. It does involve a complete change of the uh, Ukrainian state administration. Mm -hmm. We've twinned in between 60 state agencies in EU countries and their corresponding uh, agencies in uh, Ukraine. And this is exactly what uh, Ukraine needs. Mm -hmm. Then you have an open question how much money will go together with this? The EU has plenty of money to offer if it wants to, and this is something that... You don't think the problem of fatigue, you know, the, the EU has already bailed out Greece and then Cyprus, and now they're being asked to bail out uh, the Ukraine, which isn't even being offered the prospects of EU membership. Do you, do you think Brussels is actually willing to pump, you know, what amounts to $10 billion a year, at least, into Ukraine for the foreseeable future? I doubt that they will pump that much, but uh, the EU uh, can put a lot of money into Ukraine and it will not be noticed in any uh, other regards. Uh, the Ukrainian economy is very small. Think of it that uh, the Ukrainian uh, economy, it is um, like the Romanian economy, it's one third of the Polish economy. Uh, it, it will be now down probably to $150 billion of uh, uh, devaluation. So, uh, and the total package on the table now is about $30 billion. Uh, $17 billion of this is loans from, uh, from the IMF. So this is no big burden for the European Union, mm -hmm. and it will be a substantial uh, contribution for uh, Ukraine. Obviously, everyone was very shocked and surprised when Putin into the, what amounted to a military option in the uh, fight over, you know, influence or Ukraine's fate. Do you think this has made an irrevocable split between uh, East and West, that, that Russia's relationships with Western Europe and, and uh, America are beyond repair? Or do you think the pragmatism of, say, the German businesses will eventually bring uh, a settlement to this and we'll go back to business as normal? I think that this is a matter of uh, 
the total uh, uh, alienation that we are likely uh, to, to see. And there are other, many other forces that are working in the same direction. Mm -hmm. uh, the transatlantic uh, free trade uh, agreement would uh, strengthen uh, uh, the West, uh, uh, the new Western financial regulations uh, after the global financial crisis uh, are cutting off uh, a lot of contacts with uh, uh, Russia in, 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 in any case, and uh, President Putin has gone really uh, turned totally anti-American and uh, anti-Western, and uh, the strange thing is that the West uh, had reacted so little to it uh, uh, before Ukraine. So there's mm. a lot of things that have accumulated. Nevertheless, you, you've seen, you know, in the in Europe in particular, they seem to be a lot more ambivalent. Companies like Siemens stood up beside Putin and you know, recommitted themselves because they have such good business there. And at the same time, you know, the French didn't cancel the Mistral deal again because too much money was involved. I mean, Russia remains the largest market in Europe and is still growing faster than any, anywhere else. I mean, there's a pragmatism, at least in Europe, uh, because you can make so much money there. Isn't that going to continue, or do you think that's going to be badly damaged by this? Yes, I think it will be the, the damage we saw in the Saint Petersburg International Economic Forum. Um, the main uh, foreign contingency was six CEOs from uh, France. Mm. The CEO of uh, Siemens didn't dare to go to Russia again now. He was uh, occupied uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, the German companies are now insourcing from Russia. Mm -hmm. They are withdrawing uh, from Russia. Uh, foreign direct investment mm -hmm. in Russia will be severely hampered uh, mm -hmm. uh, for a long time. The Russian economy is uh, stagnating, and with the current uh, economic policy in Russia, we are not expecting mm -hmm. to see uh, more growth than maximum 2% of the uh, foreseeable uh, future. And uh, with um, energy prices uh, uh, leveling off, uh, Russia does not have mm -hmm. a very good uh, prospect. Uh, stagnating export uh, and uh, a stagnating economy and bad economic policy is not going to attract investment. Last question is, uh, one of the upshots of this uh, has been to drive Russia into China's arms. I mean, they were moving together slowly anyway, but some people have been taking the recent gas deal as a strategic, the new relationship where the two countries are tying themselves together with immovable infrastructure, you know, the geopolitical equivalent of marriage. Isn't this geopolitically um, a disaster for America in so much as you've now pushed Russia and China together, two very large, fast-growing BRIC countries in a strategic alliance that are talking about multipolarism as opposed to the unipolar world that we live in at the moment, dominated by the US? I, I don't think so. I think it's disastrous for Russia. Uh, the senior uh, Russian diplomat um, told me many years ago that uh, Russia has refused to become a, a junior partner to the United States, that instead has become a junior partner uh, to China. Uh, China is the uh, developing uh, a country, its GDP per capita is less than uh, half of uh, Russia. You, you normally don't go to a much less developed uh, country uh, as uh, your leading uh, partner. And of course, Russians do look upon themselves as part of uh, the European uh, culture. They are, and they, uh, they have nothing to do with the Chinese uh, uh, culture. And the, the, the Chinese will not uh, look uh, kindly upon them. I think that this is a temporary mistake here. Mm. Thank you very much, Anderson. Thank you. <laughs>